this is the second video that I'm doing about my dad, which is, shows his importance in my life, obviously. The first one was called Soul Contract with My Dad. It was number 19 in this series. Um, this one I'm going to call Two Animus Archetypes Vie for Dominance. Okay, And it's talking about me as a kid, how the contradiction between those two archetypes developed over time within me, and how that whole situation is being mirrored now in the culture with what's going on. So um, so it's both within and without. It's both um, me and everybody all together, the whole collective. And it's also um, showing how meaning uh, actually does get created through time by noticing memories and the patterns that they make. And, and then seeing the synchronicities also between what's going on within yourself and what's going on within the world, because it's always the case. For example, in this place, Greenacres Village, you know, now that, especially during 2020, it was like constantly reminding everybody that this place and what's going on inside this place is a fractal of the whole. It's going on everywhere. And so the more conscious we can become of the turbulence, um, the better off we're going to be. So this is about the turbulence within myself, also, you could say. So... I'm returning to this subject just, and this is, I'm working with it more complexly and you might even say multidimensionally now in showing the inner and outer correspondences over time and space. Okay, so first um, I want to describe these two archetypes. And you can look at them astrologically as Saturn and Uranus. They're both anima. Animus archetypes, excuse me, male, male archetypes within myself. Saturn and Uranus. Saturn and Uranus happen to be up now, really, by the end of this week, they will definitely be up, the two vying for dominance. And I'll talk about that more later. So let's look at Saturn. Saturn, but let's do an example of Saturn, which is my dad. And so I want to uh, just say he, first of all, he, Put himself through med school. He reared a large family, working constantly as an intern, internal medicine guy. Um, he was strict. He was fair. He was goal-oriented. He stuck to what he said he would do. He had immense integrity. And when he wasn't working as a doc, he was uh, working with um, governance, ethical problems in medicine. And let's see what we're saying. I found some more of these. Uh, establishing standards, um, I don't know what else, but then when he was 70 he became a deacon, so he switched careers at 70 to become a deacon, um, did ministering now to the soul rather than the body. Uh, he was very dedicated, very responsible. So in a sense you could say that he was also not just Saturn, which that is the Saturn archetype right there, um, but he was also Uranian in that he was able to switch completely. He also switched in the sense that he left his Midwest roots because Colo, Dr. Fred Colo, the other archetype I'm going to mention, invited him to come to Idaho where he said the fishing and hunting are great. Now there's one picture that I have with dad uh, who has just killed a deer and he looks, he's trying to be proud of himself. That was the only time he ever hunted. And that was a weekend where Colo had invited him and some buddies to stay in a lodge together where they showed some kind of racy movies, which Dad did not like at all, of course. So that's why he probably never went back. But anyway, he, he did hunt once. Uh, but mainly he was there to do a job, very dutiful and responsible. Colo, on the other hand, was from a rich family. Um, he hardly studied in medical school. They were lab partners in medical school, Colo Cryocamp, and he tells me that he would uh, look up at Dad's apartment, which was across from his, and see that he was still studying at 2 a.m. when Colo was just getting home drunk. And so he felt guilty, but he kept going anyway, just playing. He was constantly playing in medical school, and then Dad would help him pass his exams at the end. So there was a real symbiosis between the two of them. They were absolute opposites. 
and yet um, they were alter egos, and uh, I had both of them in my life. So <clears throat> when Colo went to Idaho, he was a surgeon, and then, I don't know, 20 years later or something, he quit and went to Salt Lake City and trained to be a psychiatrist. And then as a psychiatrist, he was mostly working with the most difficult patients. Other psychiatrists would send them to him. And then finally he decided, you know, this is ridiculous. People either get better or they don't, no matter what I do with them. So he quit that too. And then he became, in the final phase of his life, an organic gardener. He would have loved permaculture. And he terraced a, hill, a hillside in Salt Lake City with all of his um, food, food that he was growing. And he had a little lab, greenhouse next to it. And he just, re he relished every part of his life, but he was capable of extreme change. Dad and, and Cola, when they were together, were very, um, you know, they talked medicine a lot. And so I was fascinated by the fact that they were talking a language that I did not understand. And I've always been fascinated by languages of all kinds. And this one was just the, the, lang the language of doctors. It was like a, a foreign language to me, which made me really want to understand what they were saying. But meanwhile, then Cola would tell dirty jokes, you know, when they'd, he'd come over and Dad would stiffen up. It's like, oh, God, I have to, I have to endure this. So those are the two archetypes, and they're both within myself. And, um, and, and not surprisingly, in my astrological chart, and I will attach it to this video for anybody that's interested, Saturn, my dad, and Uranus, the wild card, are conjunct. And both oppose Mars, which lends them huge energy, both, both of them and together. Now, whenever you have a, a conjunction between two planets, especially with Saturn, Saturn's either going to channel that energy or it's going to try to stop it and kind of hold, put the brakes on it. Or you flip from one to the other. And I think that's kind of what I did and do still to some extent. But I am definitely a very serious, dedicated student, you know, have long-range plans, goals, um, you know, all the stuff that my daddy is or was. And then, on the other hand, my life has been unbelievable changes over the years, some of which I'm documenting in this series. You know, living in a yurt, for example, um, living in communes, living in, by myself, completely alone. Um, now, now to here, which is you know, this uh, community, this little village we have here in the middle of a neighborhood which we created. And so I have an experimental attitude about my life and always have, like <clears throat> I'm experimenting with whatever. And I'm following this rule, whatever fascinates me and makes me fearful, both, that's what I gotta do. So the fascination would be more Uranian, it's like, ooh, something new. The fearfulness would be Saturn, you know, ooh, I don't know if you can do that, you know. Have you done it before? Do you know how? What will happen if you do it? All of those things. So I'm um, always putting, I'm basically trying to put these principles together and have them work, um, you know, adequately anyway. Uh, it's not always easy. So, all right, let's segue now to what's going on right now in the heavens. Um, if you've been following my, my blog on exopermaculture at all, you're probably aware that we've had, and other astrologers are saying this too, we've had an incredible year, obviously. We know that, we knew that before we knew astrology, but astrology reflects it. It, it, it symbolizes what's going on down here. And um, this conjunction between Pluto, Saturn, and Jupiter uh, was ongoing from starting in January and uh, with with the conjunction of Saturn to Pluto for the first time. And then uh, by, I think it was March, Jupiter joined the two, and then it was full on from then on. And just started to release uh, the conjunction, you know, the tightness of the conjunction, which kept going back and forth, each of them, you know, moving back and forth the others. But it just be released um, in the end of December, uh, in on the 18th, I think it was the 19th and the no, the 18th and the 20th, something like that, or the 17th and the 19th, when both Jupiter 
and Saturn moved from the sign they were all in, all three of them, of Capricorn, which is Saturn's sign, okay, into the next sign, which is always a reaction to the sign before it. So the sign before it is serious, dogmatic, authoritarian, creation and maintenance of structures, whether invisible or visible, protocols, things like that. Uh, two, those two planets, Jupiter and Saturn, moved into Aquarius, which is a very different kind of sign. Uh, it expresses, it insists on individuality. Individualism becomes extremely important in Aquarius, but so does working cooperatively in a group. Um, very different from the hierarchical ordering of Capricorn is the horizontal networking of Aquarius. At least that's the positive aspect of Aquarius. I just want to add here that as we're going into this time, it's extremely important to get and remain centered because things are going to take off. It's going to become an even wilder ride than it has been so far. Now, Pluto has been in Capricorn, which means that Pluto is saying all of these structures have to be at least, at least reworked or dissolved or changed or repurposed or something. This is not working. Civilization is no longer working the way it was. You could say that COVID is like a cover for that, the fact that it isn't working and COVID was used to make that obvious, even though people didn't realize it. And also, Pluto in Capricorn is coming to the exact conjunction with itself for the first time, the first return of Pluto, which is a 348-year cycle, 248-year cycle, is coming back to where it was when it was, when the U.S. was born. So, are we going to keep this, this United States? I don't know. It's, it's not clear. Pluto will be working over the next three or four years to let us know. Uh, and so the whole Constitution becomes a huge issue because the Constitution is the founding document, you might say, the Pluto underneath everything that happens. And is it, is it still viable? Okay, so, um, so that's Pluto. But Pluto's so long a cycle that it's staying behind in Capricorn, doing more of this boiling up from the, the depths of the, you know, the collective unconscious of all the junk that's down there. And Jupiter and Saturn are now in Aquarius, and they're just, just getting going. And during this month, we have an incredible situation because by the 7th of January, Jupiter, which is the planet of expansion, generosity, optimism, um, uh, philosophical uh, perspective, expansion, um, and it's going to be conjunct Uranus. Now remember, Uranus is the planet, is the wild card, the un unpredictable, volatile, sudden changes, electricity. Um, it's incredibly, um, you never know what's going to happen next. For example, um, that's probably why they call Donald Trump a wild card, because he has the sun conjunct Uranus. You never know what he's going to do. He's going to surprise one way or another. So the so your Mars, Mar, the planet Mars, not Jupiter, excuse me, I meant Mars. Mars, and we'll go back to Jupiter, but Mars is going to reach on this, I think it's the 6th, I can't remember, something like that. The 6th, it'll reach um, Taurus, where then it will start to conjunct Uranus, which is at six degrees of Taurus now. And it's going to get more and more wild because those two, Mars, you know, puts energy into whatever's going on. So there's probably going to be a lot of earth-shaking, maybe literally too, earth-shaking events that you just don't know. It's like one thing and another thing and another thing and another thing. Again, a uh, really good reason to stay centered and grounded. Um, Taurus, where Uranus and Mars are, are going to be, is the Earth. You know, it's groundedness, it's, it's steadiness, it's supposed to be anyway. Okay, then Jupiter is going to do the same thing. It Well, not the same thing. Jupiter in Aquarius is going to be square Mars-Uranus. And so it's going to expand the whole thing. So we're going to be just dealing with incredible roiling energies of, you know, the forces of resistance, which would be Saturn, the forces that want to 
keep everything the way that way it was, go back to the old normal. There's no such thing anymore, folks. It's something else going coming in. That's that's what you know. The um, that's what Saturn wants, but Saturn isn't even in the picture right now. What's in the picture is Jupiter. Saturn will be in the picture more next month in February. So this month. I presume there's going to be some kind of jubilation from some sector of this populace and then I uh, also, you know, all sorts of things that don't mean jubilation from the other sector and they're going to be clashing um, because of Mars and Uranus. And that's just the way it is. It's just going to be that way this month. So the point is to center yourself and try to ride it, ride, ride the waves. Uh, it's not going to be easy but we got to learn how to do it. So I consider myself fortunate now to have Saturn and Uranus in my Mar square Mars, opposite Mars, in my natal chart because I've learned how to do this, kind of. I mean, not, I don't feel very resilient right now, on the other hand, because too many things have been shocks to my system. So I've had to, I've had to add new practices uh, which help me return to resilience so that I can't, that I don't fall, oh, fall sick because of shocks. And I've got to become immune to shock in a sense. So that, and I've added two breathing, a breathing practice and a cold shower after a hot shower. That really helps. It invigorates the system. Okay. Um, so, and then, so Jupiter is making the whole thing really go, really go. You know, this whole feeling of, oh my God, this, that, oh no, what is it? We can't predict it. Uranus. And then February. Saturn will do the whole the same thing, but Saturn's going to say, "Hey, slow down. What's going on? How can we bring this back into balance? How can we learn how to work with this? Figure it out. Um, tear, you know, analyze it. Get real here. Let's get more rational about it because the Jupiter energy is not rational. It's emotional and it's high spirited. Okay, so there's going to be a lot of high spiritedness with part of the population, and you know, just rolling energy with the other part of the population and since Mars is involved it's going to be um, um, you know angry a lot of angriness so and then February it's going to be and through late March actually I'm going to read this here um, all of February through late March Saturn blowback resistance slow down to figure out what just happened begin to recognize that old forms and protocols must change to absorb and integrate what just happened Again, Saturn, April, especially especially in May, Saturn turns to go retrograde on May 23rd, June through the first week of July. So you could say that Saturn's going to be very active from February through the first week of July. So it's going to be containing, learning how to contain the energies that have been released by all the junk coming up with Pluto, all the corruption being exposed and so forth, and then you know, and all the corruption, or I should say, all the explosive energies within our own souls with, that people are just triggered by this and that and this and that, and it's really hard. Uh, but for everybody, how to stay conscious during a time like this. So, and then one final time, September and October, with Saturn turning to go direct on October 11th for Saturn working this whole process. So certainly by September, we're going to feel like, okay, we're on the path now. The, the, the extreme turbulence is over. It actually starts to recede anyway in you know, late March. And then who knows what, but we're on our path. And really the path will be to learn how to make the switch between Capricorn, which is Saturn ruled, to Aquarius, which is Uranus world, we're Uranus ruled. How do you make that switch and, and hold on to what you know about Capricorn too, the good parts of it, <clears throat> but move on into the future, which is going to be much more mentally focused than the Capricorn was. The Capricorn was focused on keeping things the way they are, you know, you know, in, in hierarchical fashion too, with the 1% ruling the 99%. Aquarius is going to be, you know, the internet dominated, um, just all sorts of things that aren't going to feel so good either in terms of, I mean, I think they're really trying to bring in the new world order, which would be Capricornian, um, but they'll try to do it with AI, which called, could, could get everybody in the same way, which would be more Aquarian. 
Um, and oh, I can't remember what else I was going to say there. Um, I'm just um, listening to a woman, I can't remember her name now, I'll put it in the description, who talks about how we're being colonized, each of us as individuals, colonized down to ourselves um, by AI. And so they really want to try to own us and make us basically, um, you know, a selection of data points, that's all. I mean, it's, it's not fun to contemplate that aspect of Aquarius. But if you stay with the local scene, your local people, the people that you know, and work with groups experimentally to figure out how to cooperate but still allow each other to be themselves, that will be very helpful. Um, so that's, that's what I had to say about this. I'm, at this point, grateful that I have this extreme contradiction in my chart uh, that is spewed by Mars. Um, grateful because I do know how to ride an edge. I do know how to ride a very difficult edge at times and, um, and, and hold the line as I do or hold the reins as I do. Um, it's been one of my specialties, you might say. But the whole culture has to learn how to do this. And it's going to take time. So, thank you, Dad. Thank you, Dr. Colo, Fred Colo. Thank you for being my two animus archetypes that I have managed over time, over a very long life, to integrate.